All right, my friend, Dan, how are you today? Welcome to the studio. What's going on with you? I'm, I'm a little sleepy. I am. It, it's, uh, when it's cold, it's just turned colder. Our yeah. version of cold. That's right. Our so, um, you know, I'm a little, um, I, was, I was napping a bit before we, uh, before we, we cranked this up. Well, it's a, it's a beautiful Saturday morning outside, a little right. crisp in there. We're getting the weather changed. I think we're changing the time. We're going to daylight savings again tonight. Yeah. I think I, you know, it's going to mess just, up everything, I'm sure. Just like Cher says, turn what? back time. Okay. <laughs> There's a reference from the 80s. All there you right. Go. I love it. I like uh, <laughs> any, time, any day you can talk about Cher is a day. Yeah. I it's like Cher. Cher's all right. I mean, she's hung in there for so long. That's a good yeah, thing. Yeah, she's 123. Yeah. <laughs> she that's is. A, that's another. She used to be um, married to Sonny bon- Bono. Remember Bono, the guy from the U2? She no, used to be married to him. No. Sonny Bono. That was not the one. No, it's the other one. What, the, uh, <laughs> what, the Edge? No, no, not not the YouTube group at all. No, oh. I don't think that's that that's right. All right, well, let me ask you a question. I mean, you've been to a conference, you presented in a professional conference in a paper that you've written. I did, I did. So um, I, uh, we can't go too far into what we're going to talk about today without oh. getting a little bit of a review. Wait, 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 wait. Actually, and just, now you this, say this because right? something happened this morning, and in some way, sort of may tie all this together. It may not, but okay. Okay, I wake up this morning. Yes. Good, and good I go start. to um, actually, it's the worst thing that usually happens. It's the beginning. <laughs> it's really the uh, now. I, it's now all downhill from there. Like I was saying, that was a good thing. You're saying it's not so good to wake up. All right, <laughs> we'll, that's not, we'll have to explore that on another show. But, I'm not sure. We're so I wake be up to, and I uh, I go to let the dog out. We got one of them. You got one of them dogs? I uh, had one of those dogs. Don't don't anymore. Okay. Oh, boy, you, <laughs> he got tired of us and he left. <laughs> you ate it? <laughs> no, we, he had to move on to another household. But uh, really, really, a long the, story. We'll have to come back. No, we're not, we can't go you there. You got now. rid of your dog? That sounds sad. Yeah, that is. Well, when you put it like that, <laughs> it is kind of sad, but that's not how it happened. Really, He sad. was there. My son brought him in. He had it, and son moved, and there he go. Oh, the son took the dog with him? Yeah. Okay, that's good. It's good. It's good. And uh, we put both of them in the pound. So that's how <laughs> you that's had them both put up. to sleep. <laughs> that's right. I like that. Can we move off of my dog now? So, <laughs> or the, the former dog? Okay. So go. I went to, went to get up and I went to go and I uh, to open the, to let the dog out and I saw that who let the okay. That's it. Sorry, I like there you the, go. I like it. But the um the, the the alarm hadn't been set, and it looked at the alarm thing. And it looks like a door was open. So I go downstairs and the front door to the house. Is open. Oh, that's right. not a good thing. You woke up thing. in the morning after the night, and, and all night door was open. open. Okay, okay, this is how a horror movie starts. So, and my wife usually stays up later than I do, because um, she has this friend named Raul. They're just friends. <laughs> the pool guy. <laughs> okay, they, yeah. <laughs> well, I think they we, hang out a little at night. But, and uh, for viewers, see the earlier episodes, <laughs> <laughs> and you will know who so, he is. So, uh, uh, you know, so she's hanging out with Raul, and I, I go to bed, and. Um, so she's supposed to, you know, so she normally just hits the thing, but she didn't. Yeah. And so uh, while we go through and I'm having a discussion with, you know, I found that door open and whatnot. And then, right. you know, uh, not, um, a, not a good thing. I, I thought at this time it's, it's, you know, it'd be really important to, uh, in moments like this when you're having a discussion, that's the best time to sort of uh, WWFD. WWFD. Yeah, what would Freud do? What would Freud so, do? Okay, this so I thought, that's a that's a this, complete this, different podcast. So you can watch that on Thursdays, uh, but this the so, channel. But so we we, we got to come up with you know. So I've got to be able to to talk to her about this and and through a Freudian lens. And here's what I here's what there I think go. happened. That's that's what you do. You think go. my wife, who um has been um, um repressing some of her more aggressive urges. And um, so, <laughs> these, <laughs> almost every, I, I'm, I'm just going to say it out loud, almost every other sentence uh, is a complete show that we need to spend time on, at <laughs> okay, least an yeah. hour, two hours on, to, to dissect and figure well, out well, what's the, the, happening. This, and so, so she, you know, she has these repressed, aggressive urges. Okay. And what would happen is, is unconsciously, it's a little like a parapraxis, she, quote, mistakenly didn't lock the door because underneath it, she's hoping someone will break in and kill us. <laughs> okay. See, see, this, see? Is, this is where I, I'm, I, <laughs> anyone who's watching this will know that I look interested. I'm following the story. I, I go, oh, yeah, talk, oh, what else? That? And then there's this thing that happens at the end. So, <laughs> yeah, well, But she had that same look. Except <laughs> yeah, then, I got it. She had and it. then her reply it. was, she said, well, 
if I get me wrong, but right, but there, there needs to be a repression barrier, and there isn't one. All of my aggressive impulses are not unconscious. <laughs> so, so yeah. I think that was that really. The, the wife it. said once, "I've never thought about divorce, but <laughs> homicide a couple of times." Yeah, <laughs> really? So uh. that has been it. So, but um, now, in, in a way, that that does connect a little bit, maybe with my uh, with my talk. How? Yeah, yeah. So we okay. <laughs> the, I, I was asked in, the simple question, but uh, we went down another path. I was in New so Brunswick. How was it? I was Tell in, us about ever, it. Ever been to? I was was on the Rutgers campus. Okay, never been there. Never yet. How was I it? Um, well, apparently, you know, and I realize most campuses are like this, but apparently, you have to wear pants. Oh, they just, no, once you know, again, uh, on, uh, there's always a go-to around here. And if you ever notice that uh, sometimes it's the with or without pants. Uh, it comment. is, it is. So, so um, I'm ready for anything at this point. Go ahead. But no, I'm, I'm on, I'm on the, the New Brunswick campus. Okay. Which, by the way, guess what their favorite stew is? Brunswick stew. Uh, it, actually, it's a chowder. <laughs> of course. No. It's, it's up toward New England. There's going to be a clam <laughs> chowder of some sort. It's a chowder. Okay, I got it. I you got know. It. Um, which, by the way, I, I, I had a girlfriend I dated who smelled like soup. That's not a, you know. Yeah, I don't know. It's a homey, warm smell. You know, I'm going to just sit and and listen over and over again to the first eight minutes of this podcast and try to figure out what happened. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, but yeah, I, yeah. right now I can't tell you exactly what but happened. We're at the New, right, New Brunswick ahead. and it was, it was a good bunch of folks. It was the, um, um, it was called psychoanalysis and culture conference. Oh, okay. So people there from all over the world, there were people from New Delhi, from, um, from, um, Ireland, from Great Britain. Okay. Uh, Opelika. Um, <laughs> No, that's okay. It. I'm seeing a trend here. Um, <laughs> no, no, but, but they, they no, were, no, no, I got you. All right, there, there, so there big conference, of, a lot of people. It was, it was, it was nice. But psychoanalysts, right? Most These of them are academic psychoanalysts. Okay. It's sort of a, it's an interdisciplinary conference. So you have folks from all, uh, a lot of culture studies folk. Oh, cool. And so, um, it so was, yeah, the culture with the psychoanalysts. And so, okay. yeah, but, right. it, but the, the, the talk was good. I, but we, you know, I, uh, I, we actually did talk about the content of said talk in a prior um, podcast, but yeah, it, we, it was we, about. We, we set it up, but we didn't go too far. So maybe you need to um, kind of give us a quick overview or a couple of well, thoughts it, from it. And and also, mm-hmm. how did you think it was received? I was mm-hmm. kind of curious about that too. Well, you know, I, uh, there was a large gathering of people, and they were they were they they, they seemed enthusiastic. Okay. And I thought that was a good sign. But That's then I realized they were carrying pitchforks and torches. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, well, uh, not unlike this podcast uh, <laughs> audience, by the way. So, so uh, I, uh, go, go but ahead. still, I think I think it went well. Okay. Um, so, but, what was the gist? What was the? Here's uh, the gist, because you know we we we, we talk about this uh, that Zizek character, but oh, so yeah. sort of so this was sort of a semi tie to that. But the idea that um, that there is um, uh, we move within a context that we are typically unaware of. And that it gives us the illusion of action, and it gives us an illusion of agency. And actual agency is is um, is actually uh, intermittent. It, we only have um, moments of agency, and we are often um, okay for our viewers and myself. Uh, agency. Agency. It's like well, it's like um, like if uh, an example would be is is if 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 you. If you say uh, right now, we got what's this? This uh, Uma Uma Thur- Thurman. Uma Thurman. She's yes. doing that. She's the, the little girl with the climate change. Uma Thurman. No, no, that's <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not. Thurberg. I think. No, is Thur- the last Thur- okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. But Uma Thurberg. Good, close call. Almost. <laughs> I'm glad I caught it before <laughs> we went further. But uh, okay, all right, keep so, going. So you know this. So you 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 want to do something about this climate change thing, right. and so right. You say, okay, well. I want to um, I want to generate some agency. I will act in a way that will change things for the better. So that's an example of agency. Okay. But here's the catch. If you, if so what you say I'm going to recycle. Yes. And that isn't that that's necessarily not a bad thing to do, but it's much less agentic than you might imagine okay. because um, the act of Recycling and not going further and asking questions like, wait a minute, where does most of the wakes come from? What are the right. governments and corporations that are actually doing 99% of it? 
then what happens is you are you have a false sense of agency. You become complacent, and the problem continues to grow in the background, which okay, is what so we see with climate change. All right, so you tell yourself, hey, I've made an effort here. Things are Boom, going to get better, good. and it's going to expand. However, you're just a small... Cog. Well, you continue to be a cog in the machine that keeps running. Okay. okay. And so that was an image I used in the paper, that much, many of our efforts are just shining the cog... And the machine keeps running. And we keep doing it. Okay. So the goal would be how do we how do we change the context, the horizon of meaning that sort of defines and directs us. And so um, that's where Zizek, for instance, talks about this. But it's it's part of uh, Elaine Badu's philosophy and other folks. Like how do we how do we um, enact some form of revolution or movement forward or backward? They're all wary of this notion of progression because that in of itself can be a way of being sort of bound to context and to horizons without moving outside of them. Yeah. And it's almost a, like G.J. says this all the time. We think we're doing something, but wait, he starts to unravel it yeah. to us to the, this point where we're, we're not making progress it's not at a, all. We're just kind of mm-hmm. stuck in some things. So, but, but couldn't it be that each individual doing their part um, – by recycling or some some other measure, and we've got thousands, hundred thousands, millions, maybe doing something. Does that not affect the change in the bigger system? I well, mean, I don't know. It is a step, and you don't want to you don't want to keep the acting locally or personal responsibility out of the equation. But uh, he uses a one an example when people were protesting the Iraq War. Right. Um, there were um, set aside times when people could go and protest and millions of people did sure and so they go and they protest and then when the protest's over they go home and the war goes on and so right. literally built into the system is um a you're allowed a false sense of action so the machine can keep moving okay so that false makes sense. sense yeah yeah it does. and so for yeah. instance what would have happened if if um uh, and he uses, I think I've said this before, and it always gets people upset when I say it, but there's a quote from him that the problem with Hitler is Hitler wasn't violent enough. Right. And that, <laughs> I remember that on an earlier episode. Right. And when I got back in my chair, <laughs> I asked you the question, you need to unpack that just a little bit well, for me and for others. Uh, so what that I, means I think is, I know where Zizek's going, but you, you yeah. better tell us, I don't think. Well, you know, the, the literal... The, uh, the, Political statement that that Hitler fl- uh, well, um, hung his flag over was "Let's make Germany great again." This whole notion of the return of the Third Reich was literally "Let's get great again." We we hear that somewhere else, don't we? I, I don't know. <laughs> but, I don't know. <laughs> and I think we do. <laughs> and the whole idea behind that is is that it's it's ultimately not in a. And I'm I'm not knocking our conservative brothers and sisters because they have an important part to play in in political discourse. Sure. But it represents conservative, a poisonous conservative move. It's a step backward to preserve something that was never actually really there, and it doesn't. There, there's no change. In fact, right. the same war that propelled Germany into poverty happened all over again, mm-hmm. because of once again that they the coordinates, the horizon of their meaning was not altered. Right. So the goal would be how do we, how do we. Uh, how do we come up with some way that moves us forward? The recycling, collective action, nothing wrong with it. That's cool. But what happens, how do we change the system? And right. the example that Zizek gives is Gandhi, for instance. Um, and what made Gandhi violence is it, they just stopped working. They, right. you know, things, it can be much more if, if, if um, when... When um, uh, school teachers strike and their goal is a change in their benefits or wages, and it, they stop they teaching. Just stop, right. <laughs> and they that's a far strike. more violent act than blowing up schools because blowing up schools literally does nothing to alter a system. It, 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 is, it is ultimately a conservative act in, a, in, the, in the negative conservative sense. I don't want to, again. Right. No, but, but so... What would that look like for climate change, for instance? What would it look like to to be agenic? Um, and and not, I'm not saying I completely agree, but mm-hmm. lots of folks would say, 
whenever we fall back on our Western notions of hyper individualism. Oh yeah. Because that's part of why we're in the trouble we're in now. We're literally playing into the same thing that got us in this problem to begin with. We're not thinking about it, and it's difficult for us to think about it because our horizon of meaning is fixed. The lens that we have on, is we don't question it. It just is there. Mm -hmm. And so how do we change the lens? How do we think differently and see differently enough to enact true agency? Yeah. And... You know, again, and I don't know the stats on this, but if you look at, you know, the plastic that's in the ocean, well, um, uh, where does it come from? Um, how does it get there? What sort of um, forces are at work that are in no way being affected by any of our individual actions? And those forces right. need to be questioned in some way. Now, and Zizek, you're not advocating for no individual action. No, right, it's just way. that we have to be careful individual action can generate it, it can discharge our sense of responsibility mm. and allow okay. us to stay in a place of complacency that isn't the level of agency that we need Got it. so it, it it does um and uh Zizek and company they, they have a a real that they, they don't like capitalism they're not fans okay so um they would say that what the ultimate horizon is capitalism and I talk about this in my paper, but you know, Zizek will say that even capitalism still exists in a post-apocalyptic world because if in the post-apocalypse, typically it's a zombie apocalypse. Yes, it is. And and <laughs> all the buildings are overgrown, and everything. the guy's walking in the street by himself. That but, kind but of. But what's thing. still yeah, happening? Seen, seen that movie. You still have masses of people consuming mindlessly <laughs> in the background. Right. Right. So literally, it. it the post-apocalyptic world simply reveals the very essence of capitalism, consume. And right. so what he would say is that even we can't even in our fantasies generate a space that is, that is post-capitalism. And so uh, his famous statement is it would be e it's easier to envision the end of the world than into capitalism. So if capitalism is somehow, okay. uh, and, and right now we... We talk about neoliberalism, which, in a nutshell, the way I think about it is that we we are we are guaranteed individualistic freedom in the service of consumption. If I sort of were to define neoliberalism okay. in that way, all right, that's and one so, to uh, ponder. Just yeah, a so bit, yeah. literally, it is our freedoms. And a wonderful example would this be is and this is Zizek, not me. So, but um, we see now um, in uh, when the broadening of sexual diversity. So uh, there was a time when being gay was, was uh, you get you killed, not that it can't in some countries and maybe mm -hmm. even some regions of ours, but there's been a major shift. And now we're beginning to see the same thing with the transgender community. And what happens is once someone uh, from the margin enters uh, the discourse, capitalist discourse, they become consumers. So whatever truth they might bring in from the outside simply becomes uh, uh, becomes uh, accommodated. And then suddenly you will begin to see transgendered people on commercials selling jeans and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And not that that isn't a step in the right direction and whatnot, but it, it, it doesn't cause us to question and think about our own gender, our own sexuality, or sexuality in general, that might generate larger social change. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense because I think uh, people really are sort of focused inward on themselves. Maybe that's not a great way to say that, but the, the idea is about what they know <laughs> and, and their own meaning and their own sort of encapsulated worldview of how things are, are working. So it would take a kind of a paradigm shift to yeah. see it outwardly in some ways and people would be and more that, responsive, I guess. That paradigm shift is how do you enact such a shift? How do you create a space that that generates that shift and um part of uh, uh i mean it, it is in some ways uh again this would be zizek talking about trump and i'm uh, not to get political but oh no you uh, said that about 12 times and yeah. then we went political big time so well, go, yeah, yeah. it's all right I, I, I'm, but, I'm, uh, it's okay to talk about it although there's people you can hear the tuning out right <laughs> in going. this moment right now well but, there's a famous uh, sam harris has a line he said that um Trump is a poor person's idea of what a rich person is. And um, 
um, there is a way that um, Trump, from Zizek's perspective, represents the pure essence of the American politician. He right. just all the artifice has been is is taken away, and he he literally is sort of a a, a hyper example of of this sort of thing. And so um, uh, he doesn't. There hasn't been a step in any direction with his election. Uh, some folks on the left voted for Trump in the hope that he would literally create the sort of misery and dysfunction that would force some sort of change. Mm -hmm. And so they voted for him in the sense that he might, by his merry presence, change the horizon. Right. Um, you okay. know. Everybody makes a bad call occasionally, well, but what's really interesting sorry, about that is, is again, not to get political, but uh, <laughs> too late. That's a place of privilege. Because if your life is going so good that you can vote for somebody that can mess up the country and you're still okay. Yeah, that's something well, to think about for sure. <laughs> that's really a privileged <laughs> position. Whereas if you're really thinking like, well, you know, my, my uh, gay and transgender brothers and sisters under this regime might really fare very poorly, I might ought to think about my choices because, you know, and so I'm often a little wary of these notions that you can somehow do a protest vote <laughs> right, that, you know, it's going to work out for you. In I'm the like, end. Yes. you know, because I'm I'm a white middle aged guy, in certain income bracket, so it's not going really to bother me. But <laughs> right, right. But you know, like, uh, yeah, I think that uh, I think that uh, that's that's a that's a point. So uh, one of the th thoughts I had is we were just talking is the um, the notion that uh, this uh, this uh, socialism ideas come back. Mm -hmm. uh, versus capitalism, and my first thought is, uh, is isn't there somewhere maybe even Zizek would uh, agree that maybe some balance between the capitalist and the socialist and uh, some well, some ideas like that might work? I don't know. Well, I'm just he, throwing it out. He he has sort of this Hegelian take in that um, synthesis and compromise in a way usually preserves the horizon, doesn't generate a shift. And um, if you look at um, uh, Sanders or Warren's proposals, I guess Sanders probably tilts more toward toward the socialists. These are still squarely within. I mean, if he'd made these proposals 30, 40 years ago, he would be center. It's not a. These are right. not. These are not. So when we talk about uh, this, isn't socialism in the way it may be practiced in, say, Sweden or uh, even right. Canada? There's no, you know, like the idea of. Um, uh, uh, if if the cornerstone of of someone's proposal is universal health care, um, first off, I'm not even sure uh, that shouldn't be either a liberal or conservative concern. It should just be a concern that everybody should have. Right. That, that, <laughs> you know, when, to, when we start moving in that direction, yeah, we'll like, be better off. That it, this concern is which camp am I in? This really agree should be. Right, right. When we, if we're going to have a political, here's a cause. Let's uh, <laughs> let's do something about it. Okay, yeah. got it. But um, though I have heard, uh, particularly among evangelical conservatives, that you know that um, if your if your horizon and worldview is that this world is temporary and that you're moving through this world to get your true reward, then um, it might cause you not to think necessarily about, uh, you know, uh, if someone dies early, it means they get to go to their reward sooner. And right. so you could, you could, you right. could see a worldview that might, you know, take you away from being able to think about it. But the, the, whole, the whole notion of the paper is just how do we think and the first step in being able to do that is to, to notice the horizon in the machine. We have to be um, more aware of our context that there is, and, and there's a famous saying by Zizek, don't act, think, or resistance is surrender. And both of those constructs, you know, take the resistance is surrender. The minute one, particularly a violent resistance, in some ways it is literally playing with, you're still within the horizon. Uh, resistance is um, is still playing ball. It's still it's still being embedded in the moment that you're in and the society you're in. Uh, when he says "don't act, think," that's the possibility of becoming aware of the things you're entangled in before you begin to struggle. And uh, if it's sort of like being caught in a spider's web, the goal would be to slowly but surely remove each strand without struggle. 
So there may it may require lots of different steps in between before one gets to the quote. Uh, they also have this construct too, because I was reading uh, when I was this morning laying on the couch before I got here. Right. Um, With the door open. The door. No, I'm just sorry. sorry. <laughs> that was that was all night. That was, I did shut the door was, once I got up. <laughs> okay. Too uh, late. But yes. But uh, the the idea that to be able to um, uh, to move through this horizon, there's a philosopher by the name of Friedrich Hegel. Friedrich Hegel, uh, whatever. You, Fred, Fred Hegel. Fred. Um, Freddie. Freddie H. He um, <laughs> he talks about that um, there there needs to be a, a dark night of the soul, and that part of moving through our context to true agency, to be able to see the horizon in which we're embedded, one has to actually get to a zero point, a point of um, what he almost despair. Hmm. So uh, you can almost think uh, in the scene from The Matrix where there's the red pill and the blue pill, mm-hmm. and that if you um, if you take the red pill, it is through despair. One wakes up in a, a dystopia. Right. Um, uh, we are being attacked by robots. So there is something about being able to become aware of the context that it's in itself brings with it a certain level of despair one has to find one's way through. It's like one has to move through the valley of shadow of death to be able to get to the other side. And mm. that's p- part of what, you know, in the movie there are folks who decided to take the blue pill because, you know, hey, I'm going to go with this even if it's not real. Boom. Right. And mm. that, that sort of encapsulate, uh, encapsulates where we're at in some tribalism, a yeah. notion that these days, without, especially now, with our you? politics. And, and uh, you have a choice. And and it's a struggle if you make mm-hmm. that choice that, that to really figure out what's going on in the, the uh, and be real about things and and an objective, objectively look at things. You're going to have a struggle. So a lot of people don't want that. And that you know, whenever we're at the ballot box, I think Zizek would say that we're often only offered blue pills, and that for some folks Trump may have been a red one, but he was just a blue pill. Okay. And that there nothing, you know, that there have been no seismic shift. We haven't been. We're not addressing the things that we need to. We're, we're not addressing the concerns that are mm-hmm. pertinent to our children, and to the future of things. And not just in terms of climate change, but economically. Just uh, it, it, in terms of our uh, our potential view about each other. Um, we. Um, I will say this though. There was a wonderful meme, yeah. and it's got a picture of the guy from uh, what? What is it? Theo. Is that guy's name Theo? Uh, the, in the movie, yeah. you're talking the Matrix. Um, no, no, not Theo. Uh, Neo. <laughs> okay, Neo. Neo. Thank Neo. you. We finally came around. All right, good. There we yeah, go. Yeah, right. is Neo, and is Neo Ke- Keanu Reeves or um, who's the African American dude who? Um, what's that guy's name? Uh, it's not Sam Jackson. That's Orpheus. Orpheus. It's Orpheus. That's that guy's name. Okay, yeah. So All right, now we now we got, got, got a picture of Orpheus with this look on his face, and he says. What were you thinking? You took both pills? <laughs> well, that was a great, that's a great meme. All right. Uh, I like, yeah, I would like to see that movie, by the way. That would have been a real struggle to get all that on, on the screen. All right. So, um, well, thanks, man, for just kind of giving us the overview. I feel like we got the full presentation. How long did you present during this, uh, um, this thing? Three know, minutes. Okay. That's not enough to unpack any of that. Actually, I find uh, out that I, I there's really nothing I can do for longer than three minutes. It's just a curse. Okay. <laughs> three minutes and it's up. Okay. I know where you're going with this. No, no, and, no. It's uh, just, you no, know, I, I'm not, it's, we're it's, not it's going just, on, that, on that route right there. So yeah. let's come back. So what now that um, we've covered that, and thank you. I, I've, uh, I, I really wanted to know. I was, I was real curious based on some things you said. So. I appreciate that. So what is our topic for today, now that we've uh, already been 30 minutes into this uh, podcast? That, so. that might have been the topic. <laughs> um, maybe the, um, uh, and, and maybe it's something we can, we can touch on. Because okay. It, and we, it sounds like, if I know where we're going based on our conversation prior to recording, this is going to take more time. It could, it could. Okay. Because no, um, sure. the uh, paper that I'm proposing for, the, uh, for another conference, I was... Um, I wanted to look at, um, broadly speaking, the role of public intellectuals in um, in 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 our public discourse. Right. And you and I both know that they're um, in, in his star may have waned quite a bit, but or maybe I'm wrong. Yep. But uh, Iron Man uh, JP. Okay. Jordan Peterson. Yes. 
I uh, know both of us have tattoos. We have uh, posters in our bedrooms. Speak for yourself. I do have the book. Uh, that's all, the as book. far as I go, no tattoos. All right. So, well, um, all right. So Jordan Peterson, the controversial figure, I think it's mm-hmm. polarized a lot of people. Um, mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, um, in my household, it has done so. And so there's there's sometimes there's just a block of converse uh, of the communication uh, w- when a controversial name mm-hmm. comes up because you've already kind of gone in your corners you you've taken the one of those pills you were just talking about and you're ready to yeah. kind of fight it out so but uh, you know any you thing think? though because um if they'd offer those pills i would have thought that either one of them would have been a suppository and then it would have <laughs> it would have freely uh see but if, i can't <laughs> I can't go too far with my own ad libs because it just <laughs> it incites uh, something with you, within you. So, all right. So, uh, Jordan Peterson, what about him? Well, I th- I, my my thought is is that okay. So, Peterson sort of um, he advocates, which ultimately, again, and, and this is not in a negative sense that uh, as I was sort of thinking before, but he right. his is ultimately sort of a conservative take on things that um, we need rules and regulations. And right. that um, he sort of uses Jungian archetypes to talk about this notion that we're finding a way to sort of contain and direct chaos. Right. And that many of the things that we do, if we're not careful, and, and he, unfortunately, sort of f- staying with the uh, Jungian archetypes, that's the feminine. And so he often wonders why he doesn't have more uh, female fans, but part of his, his take might generate a little conflict in some folk. But So sure. the, cha- the chaotic yeah. is the feminine, and then the masculine sort of generates an order. And um, and the folks that often dig him, because you've got one of his books, one of his rules is clean your room. I like right. it. Right. Yeah. I, I actually thought, uh, from my perspective, it wasn't so much political and whether it was uh, connected to the alt-right or something like that. I just wanted to hear what the guy had to say. And to read the book and look at those 12 rules for life, I think, was uh, pretty straightforward. Now, you, you have to read the book, the detail in those. Mm-hmm. But cleaning your room... Mm. And stand up straight and uh, pull your shoulders back and stand up straight and get good yeah. posture. I mean, mm-hmm. okay, just at the simple level, that mm-hmm. makes sense to me. So uh, I'm down with uh, that. Yeah. I don't know what if I'm it's funny going I, down a, down a when I, when I, I When I was reading the book, I, I thought I was reading the book. And then I was like, why is all this like um, sadomasochistic bondage? And I realized it was Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Okay, so so, so well, I think you picked up the wrong book. I did. Uh, it might have been like, the cover was different. That was just going to help me in my uh, in my life. Though you, 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 you will stand up straight yeah, if you're strapped to something. <laughs> oh, okay. See, <laughs> but was, uh, you know, yeah, that's when we need the trap set. And the guy in the corner. But, 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 all right. Um, so, um, so yeah, we, we will continue to move forward here. But but the. Uh, um, uh, it isn't necessarily that the, the, the you know I, I don't I I want to stay neutral in terms of his advice. He's he's a clinical psychologist. And who to trust one of those bastards? Yeah, well, keep an and, eye on those guys. <laughs> those guys. Yeah. What the heck? Uh, it's interesting though because I have probably fairly similar training. I grew up and I was trained. He's just a year or two older than I am, but we probably were trained under the same sort of zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. And so when he speaks, I can often sort of, I can remember that was sort of the, the the academy looked like that at that point in time. And I can see that in some ways I could I could see a, uh, that he would be a product of, of, of the academy then as I was. But um, yeah, not probably not so much Jungian. I know uh, maybe uh, was that included in, in what you're in this uh, guys? I, 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 it's one of those <clears throat> you have to go outside of the regular or common kind of uh, teaching. Uh, to get well, get uh, more knowledge, I think at the time, the um, it was much more pluralistic. Like in my program, we had uh, I went to a large program, so we had like cognitive behaviorists, we had behaviorists, we had family systems folks, we had psychoanalytic folk, and so you 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 the field is much narrowed. I think now it, you really do have to go outside of the academy to find um, these sorts of things. But at right. the time. I, I, there may have been someone who had a Jungian bent in my uh, in my training program, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. but certainly in his, uh, yeah, was, or at least he sought it out. I, I think he may have his may be that it may have been something he he sought out afterwards. But even his take on Jung, in a way, again, is 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 fairly conservative. It has a lot to do with being able to um, to step back 
and retrieve something that we may have lost in this postmodern sort of post-Marxist rush to collectivism. He often, uh, there's a video where he's sort of openly crying, sobbing about um, the individual and freedom and how important he thinks it is. Right. And, and the, you know, these are, uh, these are really squarely enlightenment um, um, uh, ideas, and I think in the post-enlightenment he feels like they've been, they have been, um, they're, uh, they're under attack. Um, and so his goal again is 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 and, and so the paper I'm sort of in the attempt uh, to attempt to propose is okay. is that if in some ways and, and there's I think this is not necessarily fair but he's often connected with both the alt right and incels right and you know the alt right are looking for um, for leadership and the incels are looking for help let's say. And that he offers uh, a public persona to answer both, you know, to be, um, um, and though I'm sure there are a number of women who are invested or, or fans of him, I think the audi audience is largely male. And these are individuals who probably feel disenfranchised, feel to some degree, if you're an alt-right, you feel the world has moved in a direction that's not good. If you um, if you want an involuntary celibate, you often feel like the world doesn't allow you to be able to move in it in the way that you might want to romantically, whatever the case may be. And so he sort of offers that. So I'm wondering, like, um, what does a figure, because this is a conference on Zizek, like okay. Zizek, what, what is, um, if there is an incel, is there... W or an alt right, what would be um, you know from uh, what's what would a follower of Zizek look like? And so I was trying to play with this notion: if if there's an involuntary celibate, what would be the opposite it from uh, sort of Zizek's Lacanian Hegelian perspective? And I'm sort of playing with this. I haven't come up with it quite yet. Okay. But I was thinking All like, right. what All if right. involuntary celibate? What about it with if it were um, voluntarily accepting the lack? Like a vol lac. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still playing okay. this. All right, keep working on that. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that exactly where we need to go because um, I just got a question mark. Uh, sounds like it's Klingon. But uh, does Jordan Peterson and Zizak, or they uh, have they met? Or they been, debated. They debated. Okay. All right. Did you, well, you I have to look that you up. You didn't see that? No, I haven't seen that yet. There so isn't Jordan Peterson. You, oh my goodness. Okay. That it's really interesting too. Yeah. It really is. That's. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Jordan Peterson does have a um, <clears throat> sort of an unusual style at, at some point, but he, he seems to uh, rile up the people that he's having conversations with in so many ways. And uh, I just wonder how Zizak might respond to well, him. Well, it was, it's really, uh, I thought it would not be a format that would serve Zizak well, as, because he's sort of like a moth. He doesn't really fly straight. His conversation never really goes from point A to B. Exactly. So, so uh, yeah. I figured it would be a bit of a train wreck, but it's interesting because uh, and you can see what you think when you... Okay, I'll, I'll definitely look I, at that. I think that, that sure. Peterson sort of entered this with the idea that Zizak might be a charlatan and that this would be, you know, that he would be... Uh, and um, and even though Peterson doesn't necessarily engage directly with Zizak's ideas, he sort of picks sort of a almost a straw man Marx and sort of spends his time um, sort of attacking that. Right, um, right, right. And People in a way, have done that. I've seen that happen. Yeah, it's it's not, just, yeah. you know, and so uh, there's lots really of ways to be critical of Marx. You don't necessarily have to generate a straw man, but that that seems to be. Uh, right. And um, uh, I get the sense that um, there was a moment in the in the debate where the he says, "Well, you know, I, I when I found out Zizek's written sixty books, there's no way I could have read all that." Right. And I got at that moment. I think he was aware that wait a minute, he was dealing with someone who, who, who even if he were completely wrong, couldn't be an idiot because he'd written 60 books. Right, right. And, <laughs> and I, I think that's one of uh, Jordan Peterson's um, principles, too. What, write a I'm, book? I, I'd have to, yeah, no, I'd have to look it up for a second. Let me uh, pause here and say, uh, uh, da, 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 let me uh, compare you. No, that's not it. I've got the list here, and I'm actually looking at, at the list, but uh, it's treat the other person. Hold on one second. I'll, I'll figure this out. And I'll stumble through it in some way to make sense out of it. And evidently, uh, it's uh, uh, 
when you compare yourself. No, I'm sorry, I that one again. I'm I'm struggling to find this, but I think it might be it's worth one of it. The 12 but uh, rules. I'm going to the twelve rules right now. Assume that you assume that the person you are listening uh, to might know something you don't. Mm-hmm. I think that was the connection. Yeah, so yeah. sorry for all that, but. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, so he was engaged with that conversation, and he had 60 books to read. He wasn't going to do that, but he gave him some credit, <laughs> by the well, way. I, I so. got the sense that that sort of, you know, the, the tone sort of shifted a bit. And But you got to see this debate. you gotta, you got to see this. It's, oh, uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. It was, it was a big deal. And I think, um, I forget how much dough they each got, and I think it was like, I may be wrong, but I thought it was like 200 grand, something like that. Yeah, a lot of money. And, again, this is also, from what I understand... Zizek gave his away. Okay. So he did not. He did not. He took the money and it was given. And he showed kind of up. True to form on on some. Well, of he that. is a that's, Marxist. That's a hard to do. Yeah, that's so, right. You got to you know, spread the spread the uh, the wealth. Um, well, it's interesting too that these these are two big figures. They have mm-hmm. uh, followers and camps and that follow them. And so the uh, part of part of the problem is for that person who's so engaged in their own work to step outside and really kind of follow someone else to a point Mm -hmm. where it then leads to a great conversation where the people know each other fairly well and they can kind of converse in the issues as opposed to coming up with the straw men argument. Well, the point of the conference, sort of the overarching theme is, you know, at some point Zizek's going to die. What happens to the the legacy he's left? What happens? And so how do we think about that? And from a um, Lacanian perspective, uh, this sort of lifted from Freud, but what happens in therapy is is that you um, you come into session, and in some ways you begin to see the analyst or the therapist as the person who's supposed to know things, the subject's supposed right. to know. So, right. And you have this fantasy that there is someone out there, uh, be it the president or whoever, who's got it all together, right. and they know, and so things are cool. Right. And as you traverse that fantasy, as you get to the other side of it, you begin to realize, wait a minute, nobody has a clue. <laughs> or we have clues, Unfortunately, but there is, you know, there is no subject supposed to know. I mean, I remember when I, you know, first started working at the at the university and and oh, the president, well, the president of the university. But then you start hanging out with these folks and you realize, wait a minute. I mean, they they may know some things, but yeah. nobody here is really right. Right. We're all doing the best we can. That's really There's a, a end. tendency to put people on these pedestals, right? We're I all, mean, that's how we uh, typically you know, do things. But yeah, meet them in their human life. They're the rest just of you know. Us. Right. Okay. And uh, um, so you move from that position, and once you get to that, you begin to accept that there is a basic lack. There's something missing in all of us, that none of us have quote the answer, and there's no and. The fact that we don't have the answer is what causes everything to keep moving. That at the center of everything is is something missing that causes things to move. And so it is constitutive. It is, it is present in a way that's necessary. And the minute we're able to embrace that, that void, that absence at the center of things, that can we, we can move differently. And that we are then maybe potentially liberated in, to move in a way that moves us closer to the things that we may, we might want or makes us a little more comfortable with the things that we might want. Desire is a big part of this, too. Right. But So you get from those two points. And so I haven't, I mean, I'm just writing up the proposal for the paper at the moment, but what if a post-Peterson or post-Gizak, these are supposed to happen. The title of my paper is, right. um, so far, is He is Riven. If you meet Gizak on the road, kill him. And <laughs> All right, I like the title. It's provocative. Um, but the idea behind that is... Get folks is, into uh, your attendance. It'll be more than three people. Uh, well, there'll be one. three angry people. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there'll be a... a, a um, that's the Buddhist notion. There's even a book called If You Meet Buddha on the Road, right. Kill Him. And the idea behind that is is that um, to, to meet the Buddha would be to be trapped by the Buddha. And that it is the absence, it is the post... Buddha or the post Zizek that's more important that the Zizek is here because how do we keep moving mm-hmm. in the way that only we can move if we're if we believe there is someone out there who knows and we are enthralled to them mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you know there is a way in which be it any public figure Peterson or Zizek could fill the role of subjects supposed to know in a way that doesn't necessarily move things forward or could be um, 
Uh, I mean, that's the essence of some form of fascism, right? Someone, right. or in, in the obverse of fascism is that and we can see this hints of that in, in some of our current political discourse. We can say, well, it's the immigrant's fault. If we could just fix this immigrant problem, right. everything will be great. And notice how that puts you in a position of not having to deal with your own backyard or what's in your heart. It becomes something that you externalize, and then you move to fix it. And that's the essence of fascism. It requires um, a, uh, a projection of vomiting forth of all the things that your stuff that you need to deal with, need to deal with into someone else. The immigrant, the, uh, the Jew, and was World War II, all of these things. Uh, when it was in the racist South, we had this notion that, you know, that um, mm -hmm. um, African American folk or the North who were imposing these values on us, that that, and it didn't, it, it, it allowed us a symptom that kept us from being able to integrate and move forward in ways that we needed to do. So, yeah, well, certainly makes sense. And we were, um, it's, a, it's almost um, feels easier, or there's a sense that it's easier to project it out onto <coughs> someone else. And I think there are probably many um, connections uh, with that, that, and people have written about it for for a long time. So, yeah, I mean, that it, it does require this insight and ability to see others' uh, point of view and empathy, and we've talked about that quite a Screw bit on that. the show. So, yeah, that's right. Screw empathy will be the title of your next uh, <laughs> presentation. Actually, uh, yeah. Just and, giving food for thought there. <laughs> empathy can be weaponized in a way that also can be keep you in the in the um, in that in the uh, embedded in that horizon. Empathy can be a way to. Um, um, you have to be careful. That's another thing that could be. But maybe that's something we talk about another time. Oh yeah, no. Screw I, empathy. We've, we've, yeah, listen, we've touched on this before, and yeah. you brought that up. So I think mm -hmm. we need to, because yeah. well, I'm just trying to push people toward empathy. Mm -hmm. You're kind of saying, hey, wait, empathy's a trap. Be mm -hmm. careful with this. And um, I'm not sure. Are we dealing with the moment? Are we dealing with the future? Where, where are we mm -hmm. going with all these kind of things? But it's a fascinating idea, mm -hmm. and I, I think the ability to look at a point of uh, look at any situation from another's point of view is, is helpful in lots of ways. And that's what Zizek does, it sounds like. He okay. takes these sort of accepted ideas and mm -hmm. constructs, and, and uh, then then he shows us the ugly side of it. He shows us uh, the other side and maybe a little further down the road. Gives it another turn of the dialectic. Yeah. All right. There's so many, so many titles uh, for papers and presentations, so little mm -hmm. time. Mm. All right, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm laughing because um, the the light in back of me just turned red. I don't know what it was green. <laughs> now it turned red. So <laughs> hey, that's good. stop slapping. Oh, now it's purple. Okay, there we go. No, look, you're doing this. This is wrong. Uh, this is wrong in so many ways. But we're back to red. All right. So here's here's a here's a thought. Um, Peterson had a, all these rules. It sounds a little bit like Zizek in some of these things. Uh, take care of your own house before you criticize others. Um, clean your yeah, well, all those kind of things. Well, Pet a cat was the last one. I'm not really sure. I about think that it, but, uh, that um, that's something I'm still trying. I haven't read that chapter, so I'll get back to you on well, that one. If, if you know, and this will be the part that really sort of causes a division between the two of them. All right. I think that Zizek would be wary of any rule that um, uh, particularly a rule that in its, may enforce a level of individualism, that it may generate, um, uh, they, they, they sometimes refer to it as an atomism. It, 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 um, uh, Zizek is ultimately, I think, pushes for a collective action. Part of what, why he still maintains the, the, the label communist is not because there are various communisms, but at the core of all of them, even the ones that were hor went horribly awry, is the idea that somehow we need to be in this together. Right. That universal emancipation is the one point that all subjects should be uh, uh, aimed for. And so if these rules, they, they may focus on individual emancipation, but they may take us away from um, a universal emancipatory stance. And so he may have some some conflict over that. Like we have to be careful that um, we don't um, allow ourselves to be merely individuals, and that we are not thinking about the universal struggle for 
for all of us to be able to experience a level of, 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 um, of life that is really uh, only afforded to people in the first world. So, right, right. you know, I think he might say, is, how is cleaning your room going to stop um, the child slave trade uh, or the children who be, are being ground into dust so your cell phone will have longer battery life? Right, um, right, right. You have to be careful. All right, so um, um, th- there's a lot to mm-hmm. to really spend some time thinking through, but what about just the compromise? I tried to introduce that earlier with the notion of uh, the socialism and the well, uh, capitalism, but is there is there some way that we I we can be an individual mm-hmm. and autonomous mm-hmm. and still be a member of the group? I guess that's well, kind of my again, thought. Again, I think Zizek would say is the compromise is not a synthesis, but to realize that no one is ever an individual. That's not possible. So he might have a, a, a Hegelian dialectical turn that there is the individual, there's the potential for a collective action, and we don't find a way to group the two together. We find a way to negate both. And it's in that negation we have the possibility of seeing something beyond it. That might be his, ta- his tack. All right. I like... Um I, I, I kind of like that response, uh, but maybe maybe we could do next because if you think about this, because first off, I haven't I'm, I'm only written the first few lines of this proposal. It's due tomorrow, so maybe I'll make it. But I did write the title. I got the title. That I think good. I think starting with the title is a great place. But, and uh, um, you know my three sentence rule, right? What's in? So this is all, all writing. All right. So I don't know this hold up, but the idea that you write three sentences broadly, and then there's take each sentence, break that down, write mm-hmm. three sentences off of that sentence mm-hmm. pretty soon you kind of keep but going you got the whole thing you got the whole thing done mm-hmm. right so how do you write let me ask you that question so um I, based on what you said i'm not really sure but do, do you outline in your head you got the uh, kind of the the t- t- summarization and the conclusion ready uh do you kind of work toward a go in that or you just let uh, it kind of entertain uh what comes next i usually uh spit a bunch of stuff out and then I'll go back and I'll um, I'll uh, try to see if I can render it. Uh, I usually think in terms of sort of a thesis, and then sort of um, breaking down the thesis. So I, I tend to think that way. So it's not, but I'm I'm much more apt to to just sort of think. Like I'll I'll see where my and sometimes I'll um, particularly in long meetings, which I'm often a part of. I'll be jotting down ideas. It's, the, it's <laughs> absolutely the best writing time ever in those boring meetings. I, I just write. You I know. outlined an entire book at, at that one point. Yeah, so yeah, uh, I had a, um, something to be said for that's that. That's where I came up with the title of this and some of the ideas was I was in a very long meeting. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know? You got to get something going. Maybe we need to have a... I used uh, to be in a lot of those meetings with that Hackett guy. Well, uh, I... <laughs> Glad you brought him up. I want to check mm-hmm. in with a good Dr. Hackett. Uh, but mm-hmm. yes, he he was in a lot of meetings, and I noticed he was doing a lot of doodling and sketching in those meetings too. Mm-hmm. Not really sure he was getting paying attention, but he was mm-hmm. getting something done. So mm-hmm. that's all I can say about that. He, uh, some of those sketches. I'm not, uh, <laughs> you know, like I give uh, you an opening. Here we go. Well, right? I just so. like you know, like I, 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 he drew lots of what all I could say is they're sexy dogs. They're dogs, <laughs> but he, you know, <laughs> sort of, sort of accentuated the certain physical aspects of them to, to make them, you know, I guess vaguely attractive. I'm trying not to get a visual <laughs> of any of that right uh, this know. moment, so In I'll fact, just, he, I'll just leave that where, where it is. And it was, uh, and, and we're on top of what I'm Wowzer Schnauzer. I was like, this is, <laughs> this is wrong. This is again not, you know. wrong. But uh, what do we, what do we have here? We love to talk about Haggy when he's not here, uh, and even when he's here. As a matter of fact, I have that on record as well. So, all right. So in um, in summary, what what do you think? Uh, what what's the important uh, well, takeaway or thought I, I think that there, you there, want to leave us with today? There's a way to to discuss this, you know, maybe and maybe more make it more applicable. Yeah. But um, maybe to just bear the outline of this is that if we want to, in a way, see both of these public figures is at, it's answering something for the people that read them. Um, what happens after what you've been asked has been answered? There is something that needs to happen next. Right. The, um, you know, it's much more important what happens the day after the revolution than the day of. 
And in some ways that, that is reflective of what happens in therapy too. When someone comes in and we initiate some sort of change process, there's some sort of movement, some sort of understanding, some sort of skill imparted, it's really the most important thing is what happens next. Right. And I think that's sort of the subtext in all this, and even the paper I want to write. I want to think about what happens next and how do we ensure that what happens next can be somehow a fidelity or somehow connected in the best possible way to what happened the day before. All right, all right, and like it, it's food for thought. And uh, I don't think we always think that long term uh, necessarily, and maybe we, maybe we need to. All right, good conversation, Dan. I guess that's it. That's Boom. a wrap. We'll see you next time. <laughs>